Hello and welcome to A Stitch in Time. Today is Tuesday, February 26, 2019, and this is episode 91. My name is Carol and my Ravelry name is Knits and Pearls. The show notes for this and every episode can be found on the blog and also in the episode thread in the Ravelry group. If you'd like to get in touch, I would love to hear from you. You can send me a private message on Ravelry, leave a comment on YouTube, or post a comment in the group, and I will do my very best to get back to you. I believe I am all caught up now, so if you haven't heard from me, I'm sorry. Somehow I've missed your comment. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me here today. It is a sunny but cold and windy day here in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, Canada. There's still snow lying around from last week's snowfall, but there's some grass poking out in places and the roads are perfectly clear so it's easy to get around. I am so sorry I did not podcast last week other than a really brief episode on Friday. I'm not sick, but I am dealing with some health issues that um, the last little bit have been leaving me quite tired, and I just did not have the uh, get up and go to put together a podcast last week. Uh, but here I am now, glad to be back. Uh, thank you so much to all of you who did reach out to me after that little mini mini episode. I really appreciate all your kind comments and good wishes. Um, they really have um, just made me feel uh, really, really good. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, speaking of comments, um, there are a couple I, in particular that I want to touch on. The first is I heard from Nicole um, on YouTube and uh, she was responding to an episode a few weeks back where I had mentioned that I was reading Sad Cypress by Agatha Christie and turned out my copy was missing some pages uh, right near the end of the book and she very kindly pointed me towards um, open openlibrary.org uh, where you can uh, I guess you can looks like you can actual actually borrow actual books but you could also borrow some ebooks and there was an ebook copy of Sad Cypress available so I uh, borrowed it and actually today while I ate my lunch I read those last few pages that I hadn't been able to read the last time around um, so I feel good having completely finished the book so thank you so much Nicole for pointing me towards that and I'm sure I will make use of it uh, searching out some other books um, that I maybe can't get my hands on easily around here the other thing I wanted to mention is Barb, who's known as Quilter on Ravelry. Uh, she pointed me towards a video tutorial about um, a beading tool that you can, can make to put uh, attached beads to your knitting. And it's shaped very similar to uh, one of these uh, floss threaders maybe against my shirt. I'm trying to hold it so you can see there. You can see it has a loop and then a very stiff, um, stiff uh, section here. And um, when you use it for beading, you just would bend up the uh, tip of it. Um, like that. And then you would put your beads on here and thread it onto um, your stitch by putting these two things together. <laughs> so this tutorial talks about how you can make one of these out of beading wire, which would definitely make it more um, substantial, more durable, um, but you use it in a similar fashion. So I will put a uh, link to that video uh, in the show notes in case that's something you're interested in. As I said to Barb, I have been using just a small, very small crochet hook. Um, and I've heard of using like a floss threader, but I never really knew exactly how you employed it. Uh, so now I know, and um, you certainly could use this, but um, definitely a wire tool, as I say, would be more uh, durable and um, substantial. So anyway, thank you, Barb. Uh, pass that along, hopefully someone, uh, finds that useful. 
Uh, I also wanted to mention the New To You Craft Along, which is ending tomorrow. It has been going on since the beginning of the new year. And it's all about trying something new to you, whether it be a new craft altogether or a new technique within a craft that you're already familiar with. So if you've been watching, you know that uh, this year I have attempted steaking. Um, and there are tons of comments in that. Uh, if you go to the Ravelry group, there's a thread devoted to this craft along. And there's just been lots and lots of comments and lots of new techniques that people have shared. And it's certainly uh, given me some inspiration as far as some patterns go and also as far as some new techniques go. So one of the day, these days I need to get around to trying things like brioche and double knitting and who knows what else. There's a lot in there. Um, so even if you're not, uh, you're kind of running out of time, <laughs> uh, but if you're interested in seeing what people are up to, go over and take a look through that thread and perhaps it will inspire you too. So I will close that thread probably on Thursday. And then I will draw a couple of people, uh, draw a couple of numbers um, from the from the chatter thread there and award a couple of prizes next week. So if you'd like to see what you can win, check out the first post in that thread and there's pictures there. So thank you uh, for everyone who has taken part so far. It has been, um, as I say, very inspirational, motivational, and I've really loved uh, seeing all the chatter uh, between everyone. It's been great. Or amongst everyone, I believe, is actually the correct uh, grammar for that. Um, so with not feeling super swift this last couple of weeks, I've taken it pretty easy and uh, done a fair bit of knitting. Um, we also have been watching this last week, my husband and I uh, were watching uh, curling on TV. It was the women's um, Canadian Women's Championship um, called the Scotties. So that meant lots and lots of knitting time. So I do have a fair bit to show you. So why don't I start with, I have a finished project. I actually have one and a half finished projects, <laughs> technically. Uh, my first one um, this is my red robin sock. And yes, I do have two. Um, they are knit from Knit Pick Stroll in the Dove, uh, yeah, Dove Heather colorway. And the uh, that's the main part. And then the red is Cascade Heritage uh, 5607, which is just called red. Um, so I'm going to show them to you this way. <laughs> So that's the right side. <laughs> now, um, as I mentioned last time we met, um, I was concerned about this uh, pattern. Oh, oh, sorry, my brain is really not working that great either. Uh, so forgive me. There's going to be, a, I'm sure, a lot of this um, trying to find the right word <laughs> going on. This is the beginning and end of round, and because of the way knitting in a tube works, uh, the rows are offset by one the whole way down the leg. And so in order to have that happen on like the inside of each leg, I just knit an extra round or half a round before I began the um, heel on the second sock. And so when I wear these socks, I will put uh, these this part um, to the inside of my leg will be a little less noticeable. Yes, it's kind of OCD, but that's just how I am. Um, what I did also point out last week is that I am getting a line, or I did get a line here where um, I knit in magic loop, and this is where the uh, needles changed. I went from one needle to the other, and there's, so there's a little bit of line, and, and this is even after blocking. Um, I suspect that with um, wear that that will subside a little bit. Um, and if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. It is <laughs> just a pair of socks. After all, that's 99% of the time hidden <laughs> underneath my pant legs. But um, 
that's just a little tip if you ever have a pattern like this where it's a little more obvious than just stocking stitch or something uh, to know when your beginning and end of round is located. So anyway, enough about that. <laughs> there they are. I was really happy to uh, finish that off. I still have um, the second, this is from, these socks are from the Handmade Sock Society 1 by Helen Stewart and um, this is the sixth pair in that series. I am still working on sock number five but I have finished the first of my hazelnut socks which I think I showed last time um, and I have cast on and worked a little bit of my second sock but not enough to bother showing it to you this week but uh, yeah just one more sock to go and then I can call the, uh, the uh, season one um, done. Um, oh, I know, and also I was gonna say about this, last night I was with some friends and uh, one of my friends had, uh, not this textured pattern, obviously, it was a, it was a handmade, or a, a store-bought sock, but it was basically the same colors and it had like the contrasting heels and toes also with this light gray and I just thought it was kind of cool to see it um, and just can affirm confirm just how much um, I love this color combination it's just bright and fresh and <sighs> probably talking way too much about this one pair of socks but I really am happy with how they turned out so there yay Good to have something done because honestly for all the knitting I've done it's kind of sad in a way that that's the only thing that's um, finished but that's just the way it is. Some of my projects have lots of stitching in them so they're going to take a while still to finish. But as I mentioned I do have one and a half projects finished and my other half a project is my first of my jangle socks. So I think when I showed it to you last, hmm, I think I maybe had started on the heel. I can't remember. In any case, once I did the um, heel, it's quite an interesting heel. You work out an inc um, increase on um, create this kind of a triangular heel flap area. And then you turn your heel and then you decrease like a like a gusset here. So this pattern is by Lori Law of Oceanwood Knits and I am knitting it from some of her yarn which is uh, part of a sock blank I received as part of the Group of Seven Yarn Club for January of this year and as you can see it's based on this painting by one of the Group of Seven which are um, it's a group of Canadian artists, and this is um, Mirror Lake by Franklin Carmichael. So the colors of the sock blank were based on that painting, and um, this is what I have left of my sock blank. So my second sock will be primarily blue and purple, and I have um, cast on and just done the first little bit of ribbing on the second sock. So this is the kind of project that I keep around for, you know, car knitting and such. That's where most of this sock got done um, the past couple weeks. So yeah, um, should have a lot of the leg is going to be this pinky color, but you can see it's fading into blues there. So I'm kind of excited to see how that knits up. Where this sock has got um, a more of a combination of colors in the leg, and then you can see it goes to that purpley pink and I love the colors like right at the end here and right at the beginning of this sock it's just kind of a purpley pink so I'm really having fun with the sock blank and I actually got um, a shipping notification today my next sock blank from this club is um, I think it's supposed to go out tomorrow or maybe it was today anyway it's on its way so looking forward to um, to getting that. What I forgot to mention, I think, last time I recorded is that the next, or sorry, the first pattern in the Handmade Sock Society 
2 by Helen Stewart was being released, um, was it on Valentine's Day? I think it might have been, which I never mentioned last time I recorded, but I hope everyone did have a very nice Valentine's Day. Um, we don't make a big deal out of it. My um, husband had a romantic dinner for one since it was uh, curling night and uh, my curling is part of a dinner leak so we curl and then have dinner and he wasn't curling that night so um, when I got home we had a glass of wine and he had um, bought me some flowers so we had exchanged cards that morning so we never do a lot for Valentine's Day but it's still nice to to have a day to um, recognize your special someone in your life. In any case, um, so so I knew the next pattern in the Handmade Sock Society, or the newest Handmade Sock Society, was coming out, and I really was determined to finish at least one pair from the first Handmade Sock Society before I started on the new one. Uh, but when I saw the pattern, and then I went stash diving, and when I came up with like the perfect yarn, I couldn't resist casting on. Um, so I did. <laughs> So the yarn I'm using, I bought it Knit City in the fall. So it's from Flock uh, Fiber Studio. It is their Hoarfrost Sparkle Fingering in the Tea Room colorway. And it's this beautiful, sparkly combination of pinks and a little bit of this orangey brown. I actually have um, our little uh, bathroom downstairs for guests and stuff is... Um, kind of has a shell and ocean theme in it and I have a jar full of shells and they're like all these colors it's just like this was just like the perfect color so um so like I say I cast on and I kind of got it out of my system so I didn't work tons and tons but I did uh, get that much done and then I very dutifully um Put it away and finished my red robin socks and I haven't picked it up since but uh, I did I'm happy to have gotten a start on it and and uh, definitely think it's a great uh, yarn and pattern combination and it's just this pattern all the way down the sock so um, pretty simple to do it's not difficult um, and I think it's really effective and I like I say I love it in this yarn so so happy with that. <laughs> so I'm kind of in my mind thinking I really should try and finish the uh, hazelnut sock that I'm working on before I do any more on this. But we'll see. I'll whatever the you know however the spirit moves me is really how it's more likely to go. <laughs> um, definitely my um. um what's the word I'm looking for? Um, impulse control was not at its strongest a couple of weeks ago that's when I started that new quilt without finishing the old one and then I started this new sock without finishing the old ones oh well we really should limit rules around our crafting don't you think I mean I don't know why I impose so many on myself but I often do uh, there's two projects this week that I've really been working on um, and they're both sweaters that you've uh, seen recently. So the first is my um, second Sew Faded and I am knitting that out of uh, Hedgehog Fibers uh, sock yarn in three colors and so um, the uh, first color is um, Vengeance, that's up here. And then I moved to Truffle, and then I finished it in um, Malice. So you can see I have the whole bodice, or body, done. And then I've done a fair bit on the first sleeve. So I have a little bit more to do before I do the cuffs. And um, I'm quite happy with how it's come up. Hopefully I can get a good look at that. Get it all in frame. Oh yeah, that's good. Uh, it fits really well. I'm pleased with the fit. Um, I have not tried it on since I um, 
start at the sleeves. And um, what I ended up doing on this one is added a little bit, um, added a few more stitches around the sleeve area because the um, the original pattern, it fits quite closely and I thought I might want just a little bit more room. So I added stitches onto the sleeve, but I am decreasing down to the same amount of stitches at the wrist because I do have small wrists and I did like how it fit quite snugly down there. So um, hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully I'll be happy with this when I try it on. Um, it looks fine to me. It doesn't look like the sleeve is like overly big or anything. So I think that'll be okay. But yeah, it's, this was a great one um, to work on. I worked on this a ton when I was watching curling because it was literally stocking stitch. Um, I did end up doing color management um, at the bottom there. And... Um, I would I worked from both the inside and the outside of the skein, do a couple rows of one, switch to two or three rows of the other, and just kind of switch back and forth as I saw fit. Um, the distribution of the yarn would change every time I worked an increase, and so I just kind of played it by ear. In fact, I did rip it out at one point and re-knit a portion of it because I wasn't happy with it, but um, overall I'm pretty happy with that. And then when I was doing the sleeves, um, the first color is just a couple of rows or a few rows at the top, blending into the color two. And color two just knit up really well all on its own. I didn't um, manage that color at all. I just let it do its thing. But as the um, circumference got smaller, and just with the way the colors are distributed in this uh, yarn, I felt like it needed a little more management. So I've been continuing on this part to uh, knit from both ends of the ball um, two or three rows at a time as I see fit and so the colors are distributing fairly evenly around so happy with that um, but so I worked on I guess I <sighs> Sunday night is when I put that down and then um, picked up my other sweater. <laughs> Monday, I guess it would have been. Um, no, I know that was, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm so mixed up with my time. I know I started on the color work section. I know what it was. On my through stone cardigan. Sorry. It's that kind of podcast uh, by Bristol Ivy. Uh, if you've been watching, you know I've been working on this for a while. And this is my sticking project for my new to you craft along. Um, it is being knit from Cloudborn Fibers Highland Sport, which I did not bring in with me. Um, the main color, Shayla Heather. The uh, light color is Taupe Heather. The darker brownie color is uh, Stone Heather. And then the greeny teal is Ocean. So I did um, manage to get all the way through the boring brown or boring beige body and was delighted to finally be able to start the color work and I'm pretty sure that was Sunday and so let me just make sure my needles are in and I'll hold that up to show you so you can see I've done a fair bit I've got through the first bit of the pattern with the uh, Ocean and the Shayla Heather and now I'm working on the next section which involves the uh, taupe Heather and the stone Heather um, so I think it's coming along quite well it is um, fairly even happy with my floats I think they look good and um, getting close to finishing oh, I really don't want to lose stitches Getting close to finishing the um, that section of the color work, and then uh, the uh, ocean gets introduced again. So, um, yeah, does that help? There you go. Anyway, it's uh, coming along, and uh, there have been some decreases, and so the rows are finally getting. Um, a little bit uh, smaller but it still takes quite a while to go around 
once and um, I'm finding it tough on my fingertips. Um, the needles are fairly sharp. I work with one color in each hand and just the way that I knit um, I find, see if I got the, the um, balls of yarn in my pocket <laughs> in this sweater. Very handy for holding them. Anyway, as I knit, I'll hold one color in each finger, each hand. And so when I'm picking up this one, I don't know if that's, if you can tell, when I, I, I will often like do this with my thumb to slide it off the needle and so my thumb's quite sore from being poked and um, so I find I can only work on this for so long uh, before I kind of have to put it away so um, that's okay it'll get done when it's done happy with it so far and there were some short rows that were done um, to sh before the color work to shape the yoke and I'm really curious to see with the color work how long this yoke is going to end up being. Um, I know I mentioned before when I was working on the color work for the pockets that my row gauge uh, does not match my plain row gauge as the pattern indicates and honestly I'm not sure how it can just with the nature of color work your stitches are more square and you tend to have uh, less rows per per inch with color work than you do with plain plain knitting so I'm really hoping the yoke doesn't end up being too long but I'll kind of keep an eye on it and I'm hoping I can uh, incorporate all the color work into it so that remains to be seen uh, cross fingers because I would hate to have to eliminate any of it or have to take it out and redo it somehow so yeah cross fingers and toes um, I've been doing a fair bit of reading I <clears throat> pardon me I finished listening to Hush Now, Don't You Cry by Reese Bowen, which is um, one of a series in the uh, Molly Murphy mystery series. I've listened to quite a few of those. That was the latest. Um, as sometimes happens with hers, the uh, premise was a little bit far-fetched. Um, there's always a little adventure at the end um, when Molly is often put in peril, finds herself in peril. But, um, you know, overall, I enjoy this series. It's nothing, uh, nothing too deep. They're just entertaining and nice to listen to while I knit or sew. Mm, pardon me. Um, I also finished my latest Agatha Christie, The Body in the Library. Again, as, uh, these often are a little far-fetched. <laughs> Seems to be the theme of the week, but um, I like my Agatha Christie, so if I can I can live with that. Come to expect it. <laughs> um, and then I turned to this book called The Curve of Time by M. Wiley Blanchett. And I first encountered this book way, way back in the dark ages when I was in grade 10. Uh, in social studies class and my teacher asked me if I wanted to do some uh, book reports for extra credit and so I read two or three Canadian uh, based um, uh, books uh, memoirs in a way um, and um, this one, you know, I, I just remembered it. Actually, I remember both of them. The other one was called Tamarack, and I really would like to uh, track that down one day again. Anyway, when we were up visiting my mom a few weeks ago, I found this on her bookshelf and asked if I could borrow it, and she actually said I could have it. So I have been uh, rereading this for the first time in years. And um, it is a... 
uh, it was written in 1961, but it involves events that took place in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And it's actually interesting because I had to go online, learn a little bit more about the author and the book because she doesn't really make it clear. Uh, she starts out the book um, talking about uh, how uh, it, how the book covers a s sort of a just a series of events over several summers, uh, traveling. Uh, she and her five children traveling on a book on a book <laughs> on a boat. I think it's twenty six foot boat uh, up the uh, west coast of British Columbia, and just their different experiences and adventures. Um, it took me going online to realize that um, I wondered what had happened to the children's father and apparently he had um, gone out on their boat and gone missing, presumed drowned. So this woman was a widow raising these um, five children and um, she, yeah, she just tells about different experiences they have. It's very... Um, just, just little incidents all tied together and as she says herself they don't necessarily take place chronologically or just sort of as they fit into her memories. Um, I think pretty brave and uh, of her to uh, to take her kids uh, on this boat and they just they're I just read a, a review on um, online in preparation for the podcast today and um, someone said she certainly wasn't a helicopter parent and that's just the term I've sort of learned fairly recently which means a parent that really hovers and does a lot for their kids. She very much let her kids um, go and explore and swim and she doesn't worry about them too much and they all always seem to come out okay. Um, one interesting part, of course, you have to think about the time um, when this, when these events took place and when it was written. Um, there are some um, unoccupied uh, native villages along the coastline that she and her children explore. And some are just not occupied at the time. The, uh, the people have gone off uh, for the summer to somewhere else. These are winter villages and in one case they literally, even though there's a lock on the uh, longhouse door, they they know that there's a tradition of keeping loose boards and they sneak in and take a look at them, take a look inside while the people are gone and then they take some things from their um, graveyards and um, or burial grounds, I guess, is a more more fitting way to put it. Things that had been left for for the dead. So I thought, you know, definitely now one would hope we'd be a lot more culturally sensitive. Um, not to just mention respectful of boundaries. Um, there's a lock on the door. I think you should stay out. Uh, but I'm taking it for what it was at the time and the attitudes that existed then. Um, so that's just one of the things that I've sort of taken away from it going, hmm, that doesn't seem very respectful of you. Um, on the other hand, it's it's an interesting read. I hadn't remembered tons about it, just the basic premise of this family um, boating around the waters of, um, of uh, west coast of BC. So I am enjoying revisiting it. I've been reading that for a little bit every night before bed. Um, so, lots been going on. I think last time I recorded, I said I had a busy weekend coming up, and that would have been not this last weekend, the weekend before. Um, my husband and I went into Vancouver on Saturday. He had been asked to um, host a group of customers for dinner along with um, another couple that works for the company. So um, we did that and stayed overnight. And uh, we had watched uh, the news a few days before that and 
seen a um, feature on a new Omnimax film called The Great Bear Rainforest, which is um, coincidentally enough about the um, west coast of British Columbia and talks about the uh, spirit bears, which are also called Kermode bears, and they are white bears that are actually a um, related to or a subspecies of uh, the uh, black bear. But uh, they've evolved, I guess, to have uh, white, white fur. And um, so they're, they're, the film follows one in particular and uh, also talks about some different people who are uh, researching the different bears. Uh, we also saw shots of grizzly bears and black bears. And also, um, it was filmed up near Bella Coola, or at least parts of it were. And there is um, a gentleman there, uh, part of a native uh, community whose um, job it is, or role it is, to uh, look after or be guardians of the spirit bears. And he is passing all of his knowledge on to his uh, son. And so there's some footage of them sitting very, very close to these, uh, to one of these bears. And the bear didn't seem to mind, and they just were very respectful of giving the bear uh, space. And obviously the bear is used to seeing them and was not alarmed. So just fascinating, uh, amazing shots of these animals and the um, scenery. It was, uh, was um, really a really good film. It was about, I think, 45 minutes long. And I'd forgotten, I guess the last time we went to see an Omnimax film, I think we were sitting further up in the dome. This one was, for those of you who know Vancouver, it was at um, Science World. So the theater is inside the big silver dome. So this time we were sitting quite near the bottom of it. So we were wa you had to watch the film like this the whole time with your neck stretched back. The seats do lean somewhat. And so you're looking all around because it's not 3D, but it's, um, or it's not 360 degrees, but it's probably 180 anyway, if not more. And so you're constantly looking around to see different parts of the shot. Anyway, so we did that first uh, before heading to the hotel and getting ready for dinner. So that was, um, was really good timing. Um, and then we didn't linger in Vancouver uh, like we normally would. If we ever stay downtown, we usually do something the next uh, day before heading back to uh, Chilliwack. But um, we had a um, hockey game to go to locally. My husband's company is one of the sponsors for this um, team and it was their sponsor appreciation get together before the game. Plus their uh, president uh, retired this year and they were doing like a little tribute to him. So my husband wanted to be there. So we attended that, came home, <laughs> got changed, headed back out uh, to go to the hockey games. So we went to this little event and then watched the game and the team had a chance that day to uh, clinch first place in the league overall for I think it was the first time in 18 years. So they did in fact uh, win even though they didn't play very well honestly but they did uh, did succeed in that so it was a really um, good game to watch for that reason and and good timing on their part um, just with the tribute to their uh, retiring president and such. And then just as an added thing, I had learned, I guess the day before that my, uh, the school that one of my sisters teaches at, um, the choir was going to be uh, doing the national anthem at that game. And my sister is the choir director. So I got a chance to see her there and directing her choir and they did very well. So yeah, it was a really, really nice afternoon. And then we literally came home, had a very short time before we headed out again uh, to go to our youngest son's and his uh, girlfriend's for uh, dinner. And um, we had not, well, this is my son's girlfriend. Her mom passed away um, on New Year's. And we very, very briefly met her stepdad at uh, her mom's service. And she had said that she wanted to get us all together to uh, get to know each other. So um, he had been invited too, and we 
um, had a nice evening getting to know um, know her stepdad and um, had a really good dinner. She made uh, beef bourguignon out of Julia Child's um, The Art of French Cooking. I think that's what the book is called. I guess she had been watching um, uh, Julie, was it Julie and Julia? Pretty sure that's what it's called. The movie that Meryl Streep is in where she portrays Julia Child anyway. And she, she was watching the movie when my son came in and uh, they basically paused the movie so she, he could go order her the book so that she would make the uh, beef bourguignon for him. <laughs> and so she'd made it once before and then uh, so she made it again for us and it was amazing. It was so good. She did a really great job and I guess it's an all day thing. She started I think at 11 o'clock that morning she said. 10 or 11 and we ate at no, 6, 6.30 so it was quite a process but oh, was it ever worth it. Um, and then as I mentioned we've been watching curling this week so the Scotties is the women, Canadian women's uh, championship that takes place and uh, even though I've followed it uh, before uh, we were, we, both of us, were especially interested this year because the um, BC team was being skipped by a woman from Chilliwack who curls out of our uh, curling club. Uh, neither of us know her, we haven't met her, but it was a real personal, uh, put a real personal note on the uh, games and we were following her all week and watching different games when we could because she was on some of the um, games that were featured on TV. So we'd rec I'd record them, we'd record them in the day, we'd watch them at night most of the time. Uh, unfortunately, well she did make it through, there were 16 teams, she made it through to the next round where there were eight teams and unfortunately didn't make it into the finals but um, this was her first time being at the Scotties and uh, definitely got very, very favorable um, reviews from people watching her play. So I have no doubt that she'll be um, back again next year. At least I really hope so. Uh, so really kind of proud of having that connection. The team itself is um, referred to as being out of Abbotsford, which is the next city over but she does live here in Chilliwack and also curl out of our club. So that was, um, was quite exciting. Um, and made for some good downtimes. Like I say, I got lots of knitting done watching the curling this week. And then, um, just trying to think. Oh, Saturday, <laughs> this past Saturday, we headed into Vancouver again. Uh, this time to go see the Vancouver Canucks hockey game. Uh, we took some customers, hosted them for dinner and the game. Some uh, tickets had become, for this had become available late in the week. And um, Cameron had customers he wanted to take, so we, uh, he was able to get the tickets and do that. So they had, we all had a good time. And it's um, a couple that we've known for a long time and their two sons and one of their sons had gone to school for a little while with uh, one of our sons so you know there's, there's some connections and we've like I said we've known them for for quite a while so it was um, a nice evening um, and then Sunday uh, yeah we just took it easy <laughs> went grocery shopping other than that didn't do a whole lot and then ended up watching we'd recorded the last two games the semi-final and then the final for the curling uh, during that day, so we watched it uh, that evening. I think we started watching around five o'clock, and they were both really good games. And so it was a good, nice way to end the weekend. Um, definitely entertaining. Um, and then let's see. Last night was um, our uh, monthly, uh, what we call ladies' night. So a group of friends that get together every month and so the woman hosting it uh, she always likes to do dinner for everyone so she made tacos last night for all of us and then um, we had talked about playing Pictionary last month so she had it all set up for us there only it turned out to be five of us all together so we split into a team of two and a team of three and uh, for some reason I was really on fire last night 
and got some tough ones. Um, so our team won, yay. Um, but okay, so if you've played Pictionary, there's different categories and you, it's like charades only you have to draw it on paper. Or if you ever watched um, Win, Lose, or Draw on TV, that's a similar thing. So one of my words, which was under the difficult category, was object. Can you please tell me how you were supposed to convey an object? I couldn't. <laughs> we didn't get that one. I just thought, how vague can you be? Um, anyway, we did have a lot of fun. And then uh, I was going to get ready to record this morning, but then uh, my daughter Jessica got in touch and said that she and uh, my younger granddaughter were out and uh, see if they could stop by for a visit. So uh, they did do that. It was really nice to see them. And um, it was great because I had my um, Cedarberg shawl draped over the uh, back of our love seat in our living room and Jessica saw it. Well, actually, I was wearing my Tulamine shawl or it was lying there too. I can't remember which. And she complimented me on that. And then I held up the Cedarberg and I said, do you like this? Because if you like it, you can have it. It's too big for me. And she was all over it. So, so yay, it was gone to a good home. And then I went downstairs and pulled out my, uh, what was it called, planting seeds that I had knit. It was from the um, Shawl Society 2, I think. Um, this last one, anyway with uh, based on um, yeah Shell Society 2 based on uh, the secret garden anyway she loved that one too so that was great um, two shawls that I won't wear gone to a good home so yay and uh, tomorrow is my husband Cameron's birthday so um, took forever to pin him down to what do you want to do for your birthday because he doesn't really make a big deal out of it um, so we finally, we decided to go out for dinner. So we're going to go out to our, um, one of our favorite restaurants, a Greek restaurant. So we're going to do that for tomorrow night for dinner. So that should be good. Um, and I think I, I talked to Jessica and we're going to try and do something this weekend, either just with their family or see if the, uh, our, um, boys and significant others can all get together and we'll just uh, hopefully get together and celebrate his birthday as a family but um, won't be anything elaborate or anything like that so yeah you tired of tired of my voice yet <laughs> a lot to get through when you miss a couple of weeks or when you're gone for when you miss a week of podcasting there's a lot was um shoved into those two weeks so um before i say goodbye i thought long and hard about my something good this week and what kept popping in my head is you <laughs> the viewers um you know just just to hear from so many of you last week oh hope you're feeling well i miss you get ready you know hope you feel better for podcasting we miss your podcast etc etc well, thank you. Um, it just means so much to me. You really do. I have said many times, and I can't say often enough, how much I enjoy doing this. What I really enjoy is the interaction with you. So I'm always so grateful when you take a minute to uh, reach out and say hello. Um, so thank you for that. I do really, really appreciate it. And you made my week. <laughs> so on that note, um, as far as I know, I'll be back next week. I certainly have every intention of, uh, of doing that. So uh, take care until then. I hope you have a great week and get lots of crafting done. And um, yeah, talk to you soon. Bye.